Uh, morning, morning, everyone. I've got a big, big grin on my face, and that's because, um, and I'm going to let you into a secret here. If, um, if your organisation has the words national audit and office in the title, you don't get invited to many parties, right? So um, it is really exciting to be here. Um, so maybe this is a bit of therapy uh, for me. Um, but what I would say is that uh, we've got an interesting organisation at the Audit Office, and hopefully I can convince you that by the end of this session. So quickly, first off, a show of hands. Who's heard of the National Audit Office? Hands up. A fair, a fair few. Um, how many of you have worked with the National Audit Office? Oh. I was going to say excellent none, but there's two. Um, I was going to get to say anything I wanted in a minute, but um, I, I, will, uh, I will have to keep myself honest here. Um, I mean, essentially, what we are is independent of government. So people think we're a government organisation. We're not. We work for Parliament. So essentially, my boss's boss is King Charles. Interesting appraisal conversation coming up, I'd have thought. Um, but essentially, our role isn't to question the policies of government but it is to look at how well government's spending the cash that it's given. So hopefully today, um, I'm not going to answer the question of how does the UK increase productivity, because that's a bit of a policy challenge. And if I knew the answer to that, I'd be on a beach in Tahiti, um, quite simply. But what I can tell you about is what we see as the productivity challenges for government organisations. And the reason that I'm able to do that is hopefully because my so, job, my job is all about this. Um, I spend my days looking at how government organisations take their strategic intent and turn it into some kind of operational reality. And it's a massive privilege because I get to go and see how the Royal Air Force recruits and trains its pilots. I get to see how the Department for Work and Pension helps people into jobs. Um, I work with the BBC, seeing how they produce their news output, and uh, spend a bit of time down at the Bank of England, seeing how they run, uh, run the bank. Um, so it's a huge privilege, uh, and I've worked with about 40 different government organisations over the past 12 years or so, seeing how they take strategic intent and turn it into operational reality. Um, but what it does do is gives me an insight into what some of the common challenges are, and the things that not just government organisations, but others might find they, uh, they, they consistently come up against in terms of uh, challenges. So today, um, what I'm going to try and do is uh, share about 12 years of insights in what I think is now about 10 minutes. Is, is that about right? Um, but uh, what we'll hopefully get from that is a bit of an insight into what it is that the better organisations have in common. So, share with you some of the challenges for government organisations, what that might mean for the productivity challenge, and then finish on a bit of our insight on, on where to start. And as I said, I think there is relevance in here, whether you are a government organisation, a supplier, someone that's affected by government policies, or a different industry altogether, because a lot of the challenges, uh, certainly from my work with private sector, are, are common there, there too. So what's this got to do with lean thinking? You might well ask, and I think that's a reasonable question. Um, well, I'll take you back to 2008, as I'm sure you're all aware, momentous year 2008, um, Lady Gaga's debut album released. No fans, lean thinking audience, no Lady Gaga fans, I can't believe it. Um, anyway, what it was also uh, notable for was this piece of work, and this is a still, a photograph from a, a report we did on how the Royal Air Force was repairing its uh, aircraft. Because um, we'd heard that they were using this thing called lean thinking to help them do it better. We knew nothing about lean thinking. So we went to everyone's favorite problem solver, Google, and said, lean thinking. And fortunately, up popped the name Dan Jones. And we thought, right, we better get this guy involved. He might be able to help us. So we did, and Dan came with us to the repair sites where the Air Force were fixing their aircraft um, and had a look at how they were using lean thinking. And it was a really notable uh, piece of work because for once, as the audit office, we were telling a really good story. They'd uh, achieved cost savings of around 1.4 billion pounds, lean thinking contributing to that, that's amazing. Um, took 20% off the time to repair as well. So a really notable story, and actually had wider impact, because it actually saved costs for the audit office as well. 
So as I said, this is a still from our uh, report then. But what we also discovered at this time wasn't just the Air Force investing in lean thinking, but lots of government organisations, be it the Department for Working Pensions with their lean programme, the Tax Office, everyone's favourite, HMRC, with their Pace Setter programme, invested £120 million in a programme of lean thinking to try and train its people in how to apply the principles. So as an audit office, our role isn't to maybe look at how well government is applying lean thinking, but we are interested in the so what, the benefits from applying principles such as lean thinking. And that's why we decided to get a handle on how well they were doing that and went out to answer three questions. How capable is government at managing improving what it's doing? What are its priority business problems? And if we answer those two questions, what is it that can achieve some kind of sustainable improvement or productivity improvements? We didn't really know how to do that. There's a common thread here, not knowing how to do things. But went out and got some help. If we're going to answer those questions, how might we go about it? And we started that by looking at the public sector. How would you try and answer those questions? We went to private sector, spent a bit of time with uh, Tesco, seeing how they think about managing and improving their business. We went to uh, Toyota uh, and met their HR lead at the time, a guy called Jim Crosby, who just kept asking me, but what's the problem you're trying to fix? I uh, like, what's the... I had no idea what that was all about, but a few years later, I, I, did, I did get it. Um, and we also went to the academic world, so worked with uh, Warwick Business School and Harvard Business School in the US to try and come up with a way to answer the question of how capable is government at managing and improving what it does. And uh, we came up with this. Um, really not that revelatory. Um, if you sat in a room today and thought about how will I create a way of looking at an organization and working out how well it does its business. You might come up with similar things. So you'll see at the top here, we've got five areas, strategy, information, people, process, and improvement. As I said, no shockers there. And then we've got two different levels of an organization or a system that we look, that we look at. Above this sort of uh, hash line, what we variously called the corporate center, the organizational level or strategic management, and below the hash line, uh, where the work is done, so either processes or services. But the trick about this is, is a couple of things. One is that we're less interested in these individual domains and more interested in the glue that holds them together. So is this working as a seamless integrated system? How well is that glue working to run the business well? And secondly, we try and understand how well it's working, not by asking people questions sitting in a room, uh, and them showing us their lovely strategy, uh, but actually understanding the answers to the questions of how do you know and so what, and by doing that, by going and looking at how the business is working day to day. So I spend my time sitting in boardrooms, listening to the execs, think about how they're going to use their performance uh, information, how they're going to change their strategy, what they're going to change in their business, and then the next minute I'm putting on a stab jacket, going out with the immigration enforcement teams in the streets of Manchester seeing how they do their work. Um, it's pretty eye-opening, as, as you might imagine. And we do get a feel for how well the organizations are working. We've got 40 questions that we ask, that how do you know and so what basis. And I'm going to show you how well government is doing. So this is the aggregate of all those organizations, those 40 organizations and 120 services that we've worked with. Each of those bars uh, a different one of the questions we are interested in. I'll give you a clue, red isn't so good, green is really good. Uh, any observations from that? Lots of opportunity, lots of opportunity. excellent. Because <laughs> normally it's, oh, it's not very good, is it? No, it's lots of opportunity, and that is true. Um, in one way this was interesting, but it didn't tell us a lot. So we got our stats team to crunch the data. We've got thousands of data points from doing this work, and we asked them, what are the common things that the best performing organizations have in common? And they said it's these four things. There are about a dozen questions. Some of them to do with creating clarity of purpose, others about creating a good end-to-end -end perspective, how you use information to improve, and the management and leadership environment that underpins all that. Nothing revelatory in this. But this is the evidence from doing all the work with government. And as you can see, not many getting it really, really right. The other thing was that 
the better organisations did have what we describe here as a whole system approach to change. Um, and to give an example of what we mean by that, we tested uh, all the scores, all the results that people got at that kind of strategic management level and looked to see what kind of correlation there was between being good at that and being good at delivering services. There was no correlation. So you could be good at one and it would have absolutely no impact on the other uh, and vice versa. So that did say to us, there is a whole system approach needed. And I think this is quite interesting when you maybe think about lean and lean thinking as a strategy. So how do you think about where and how you use that to help you manage and improve your organisations? What does that mean in practice? Well, I'll take you on a journey through one organisation that we worked with. 2012, they invited us in. We do get invited in, I was just, uh, was just joking. Um, and this is their capability at that strategic management and operations level. Um, they did have commitment, wanted to do something, wanted to change. Um, and in 2014, they got uplift because their new chief exec that came in created a new strategy. There's a bit more clarity about what they're wanting to do. Um, you know the kind of thing. We've got words uh, that describe our strategy. It's a triangle. We've got the same words. They're now in a circle. But at least everyone knows what we're all about. Now we've changed our, our direction. Funnily enough, though, we went in 2016 to one of their overseas directorates. And I think, as you can probably see here, that uplift uh, if you look on the left-hand side, I describe it as the shout is starting to get quieter as you go further away from the kind of core headquarters. And then in 2020, we're pretty much back to where we started. So there's an interesting thing happening here, which is probably contextually really important for government. Can you think about the number of different prime ministers we've had in the last year, let alone heads of departments or ministers in departments? How much consistency of purpose there might have been in these organisations and in the might of noise? that's been there. So really contextual challenge here for government if it's gonna to get to any productivity improvements. Where, what is our true north goal? Where are we headed as a business? Quite difficult to keep responding to that kind of noise. So what does this mean in terms of the productivity challenge? Should we, should we care about this? And we definitely should. Because about 400 billion pounds spent by government each year just on grants, uh, administration and services, let alone the cash that's funneled through those and things like benefits. I can't get my head around that number. It's just, it's just massive, isn't it? So if you can make productivity improvements of even small amounts, that's a massive size of the prize, isn't it? So there's a cash imperative. There's also a service imperative. We all get affected by these services, whether you're trying to get through an airport and they don't have security staff because they've not been cleared by government, whether you're trying to get a passport uh, from the passport office, or whether you're actually wanting to go and get your COVID vaccine. Uh, these are all things that really matter to us as service users. Uh, so there's a customer dimension on this, which is extremely important, extremely important too. So it's puzzling, why is this so difficult? Um, and what might this mean in terms of how to address this as a productivity challenge? And there are two, probably two different ways we can think about this. The first is the degree to which government is doing the right things. Uh, my colleagues over in the Treasury would probably call this allocative efficiency. Um, I just call it doing the right things. Um, so how do you make sure that government is thinking about doing those right things? I'll give you an example of how tricky this can be. Um, I'd like your thoughts, actually. How would you try and address some of this, this challenge when we get to the end? Um, anyone remember this ad campaign? <coughs> 2019, uh, the, the UK army was trying to attract a new generation to apply to be in the army. So they wanted uh, zombies, millennials, and class clowns. Um, I spent my autumn in 2019 looking at how the army recruits new soldiers. Um, really fascinating, fascinating uh, experience, particularly the, the young lad at the physical training uh, tests who was quite honest and said, I'm only here because my mum's given me 50 quid uh, to come. Um, he didn't last too much longer, I have to say. But what we did discover as part of that was that everyone, no matter where we were in that process, said, yeah, the real problem here isn't that it takes us 320 days 
on average to recruit someone new into the army, 320 days, that's amazing, isn't it? Um, the real problem is the GPs, because they don't return the medical forms that we send off to them. I thought, that's interesting. Fast forward a few years, uh, just last year, you might have heard about backlogs in issuing driving licenses. Get this, if you've got a more complicated driving license, maybe you have a medical condition, you're going to be delayed because those GPs aren't returning those medical forms. And if you've ever worked with hospitals uh, or had experience yourself of trying to, uh, trying to uh, either get someone home from hospital or if you're working in a hospital to discharge patients, you'll often hear about, well, the community provider, they're not getting back to us, helping us actually put in place the things we need so that we can discharge this patient into, uh, into uh, the community. If you're a GP, what do you think you're thinking, uh, being on the receiving end of that? I suspect you may be thinking this, right? What's this got to do with me? I'm trying to recruit for my practice, put a roof over the practice, you know, maybe even see a patient or two. But there is a serious point here, because every organisation in government does tend to look at its problems through its own lens without having that bigger kind of how do we do the right thing kind of conversation. And I understand why. Um, but it's really important uh, that it does take that wider, wider uh, perspective. You might remember this photograph. I think it's, it's a great example, isn't it? Because what he's really saying is obviously I've got three children, three children now, not just, not just one that I've got to look after with my, my wife. But really important view, if you start seeing things from different perspectives, you might be able to see what would doing the right thing actually mean in these kinds of circumstances. But government's incentivized maybe to look through your own organisational lens. That's how you get given money to do the thing for your organisation, your policy. That's how you're held to account. But that doesn't mean you can't maybe think of things in a slightly different way. I was lucky enough to work with Washington State in the US, and they have quite a different way in which they hold people to account. This is a still from what's called performance reviews that Washington State do, and they get every organisation that touches uh, a particular policy area to come in and contribute to how they hold people to account uh, for what's happening. Um, this is uh, an example of them actually getting in the lived experience as well. So it's not just the political or the, the, the administrators, it's the people affected by the services too. So they can start having open and honest discussions about what's really, really happening. Um, so there is a different way that things can be done. Uh, we're just not quite doing it in the UK as yet. So doing the right thing, a massive opportunity. The other side of things is, and you've got there already probably, doing things right. Um, there was lots of red on that chart, wasn't there? Um, so lots of opportunity uh, to do things right. And I guess what we see in government is that very classic, a lot of investment, a lot of energy going into fixing problems after they've gone round, workarounds, uh, redoing things, etc. So a lot of this kind of thing, which I'm sure you're familiar with that, you burn, I'll scrape kind of approach, and just keeping on doing that. Or if you're in the Novotel across the road, you don't get burn, you get that warm bread uh, kind of thing. Toasters all over the, the world, it's the same, isn't it, in hotels. You put it in, it comes out as warm bread. And then you get the burnt, because you put it through again, don't you? But we all keep doing it. So a bit like that, this is what's happening in government. And what's really happening is it's the basics which you and I might see as lean thinking kind of proponents as the basics which government is struggling to get right. And I'd like to share a few of those with you now. And as we go through them, I don't think you'll be surprised by these, and I'm sure you're probably working on these yourselves. Um, or you're maybe really good at these things, and I'd like to hear about that, because I think government can steal with pride from other organisations, other sectors and actually adapt, not copy and paste, that fills me with dread. Uh, we'll just do that. Oh, something strange has happened. Yeah, well, think about your context. The three things that government routinely asks for help for from us, and which it struggles with. Understanding and meeting demand, using process performance information, and systematic improvement. Again, no shockers, no shockers there really, are there? But a huge amount to go at from a government perspective in here. And I'd be interested how many of these are the things that you're getting really good at or are focusing in your organisation. Understanding and meeting demand. You know those 40 questions? 
The ones which we ask around understanding demand, the one, in fact, that we ask around understanding and meeting demand, uh, how do you go about that? How do you know what do your, your customer actually is looking for here? How do you go about serving that in a good way? It's got a really strong correlation with overall capability. So these will be familiar with you, focusing on user needs. This is kind of government speak, I guess, for understanding your customer. We don't like using the word customer too much in government for, for various reasons. Avoiding one size fits all, that's about absorbing variation uh, in demand. So really, really familiar things. Using process performance information, uh, just getting a handle on what is it we need to run our organization better so that we can make conscious, informed decisions. Um, I'll show you the scale of this challenge here. One organization worked with immigration enforcement that I mentioned earlier. We produced a report on those, and there's a lovely chart in that uh, report which describes how they're measuring performance. Um, how would you get on if, to understand how well you're doing, you had 740 different measures? If 1% of them were lead measures and told you what was likely to happen versus 99% telling you what had happened, and 4% focused on quality, that's a pretty, pretty interesting position to be in if you're trying to make decisions about what to change and how to improve your business. Um, so getting this right, uh, as well as the, the managing, understanding managing demand, two, two basics. Next up, though, systematic improvement. And I think this is the one where uh, government really needs to think about if it is to try and address that productivity challenge, maybe try and think about how to get better value out that 400 billion and improve the services that, that you and I use. Because um, if you don't change uh, the way in which you go about improvement, you, you might make changes, but you won't improve, um, and you definitely won't achieve any kind of productivity improvements, or there'll be luck if, if, if you do do. They won't be conscious and informed. So what's the consequence of all this for government? Well, we routinely see government working in what we describe as this kind of firefighting mode, moving from one crisis to the next, one massive challenge to the next, um, rather than at the other end of the scale where they're actually doing some controlled whole system continual improvement. And I guess um, the system's built for that. You know, crisis management is celebrated. You did a great job when things were up against the wall. Um, I don't know if this is similar in your industries or, or quite different. Um, people also, curiously, tend to get rewarded, uh, tend to get, maybe get promoted for that kind of response as well. So something needs to change if you really want to think about how do we... It'd be great if people were rewarded and promoted for... It's really quiet and calm where you were, wasn't it? You know, it'd be quite a, quite a message uh, to be giving out. So where to start? Well, where to start probably takes us back to the beginning. Um, so of those four areas that I talked about that our data told us mattered most if you're going to run a good organization in government, the management and leadership environment questions had the strongest correlation with capability in that, that kind of sea of red section about improvement. Um, so maybe you need to start there. And what does that mean? Well, I think it probably means having some kind of conscious uh, sort of way to think about people development. Um, so how do you start addressing some of those, those basics? What does that mean if you're going to build an organization that can actually manage and improve what it does well? And in government, that means thinking about more than just the base of the pyramid, these senior leaders in government, which represents about 2% of 408 thousand civil servants working in government. But that's where we tend to focus in government. Government tends to focus its development capability building. For me, that's too late, isn't it? Up here, where you're working in those kind of complex services or processes or systems or managing them, that's the stuff that's adding the value to your, your customer clearly every day. So how do you start to build a way of building capability so that by the time you're leading these kind of complex systems where you've got lots of different people in a web of services trying to, trying to do stuff, how do you make sure we're all talking the same language or thinking about things in a similar way? And if you get that right, um, that prize, that 400 billion, and a better set of services for people like you and I is, is surely, surely worth it. <coughs> but I'm pretty curious, I guess, um, 
how much of this resonates with some of the challenges you have in your organizations? You know, how many of you are doing some of these things well? Where can government learn that it's not looking to at the moment? And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for the latest lean content.